live from Earth, it's Space Radio. This is Paul Sutter, and coming up, we're talking about moist exoplanet atmospheres and, of course, taking listener questions about all things in the universe. We record every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern here in Spaceman Studios in New York City, and you can follow along or leave a voicemail at spaceradioshow.com. And in today's Blue Shift, I'll be talking about... It's a matter of interpretation. But first, the news. Hello, space cadets. Welcome to Space Radio. I'm Paul Sutter, astrophysicist at Ohio State and the Flatiron Institute. And for the next half hour, your agent of the stars. Got an exciting show for today where we talk about space, astronomy, astrophysics, rocketry. If it's above the Earth's atmosphere, it's in this show's universe. This show lives on listener questions. We record every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern here in Spaceman Studios of New York City. So leave a voicemail at spaceradioshow.com to get yourself on the air. You can also follow along with our space cadets tuning in live from around the world, including but not limited to London, UK, Ashburton, New Zealand, Montevideo, Uruguay, the nation's capital. I'm assuming Washington, D.C., Pell City, Alabama, L.A., California, South Austin, Texas, Galway, Ireland, and Dublin, Ireland, and more. Go to spaceradioshow.com for the link so you can follow along. We'll take questions that you send there too. Seriously, folks, I am so lazy, but I somehow get a show out every week and that's because you provide the content. So get those questions in. How's it going, Space Cadets? I miss you. Made in New York City. (laughs) Like only the best salsas are. Yeah. Oh, Already tons of great questions. I love it. Denver, sorry, Elliot, a little bit too late to get on the show, but you are indeed from Denver. Oh, man, I love it. Do you guys like how I basically turn the second half of the show into a lightning round of your questions, or do you want me to dig in deeper? I'm I'm honestly curious because the past couple weeks I've been experimenting with with the lightning round version of the second half. Yeah, lots of of love for Nightbot. Thank you again, Nancy, for showing up and wrangling Space Cats. Did my book do well? My book is doing fantastic, actually. We got the report way back in May from the publisher. That was the six-month mark. Book is selling very, very well. It's still on shelves. By the way, if you're in, find yourself at the Barnes & Noble in Midtown Manhattan, there is a secret signed copy sitting in the Barnes & Noble there. I, I plan to do more. I, I swear if I have a pen and I'm at a Barnes & Noble, I will sign a copy. Uh, but the book's doing great. The book's doing great. And there's going to be another book. It, I don't know why I whispered it. It's not a secret. I, I'm writing another book. It'll be out as early as fall 2020, May of spring of 2021. I'm writing it right now. It's called How to Die in Space. It's so much fun. It's a really fun book. Get a rope. <laughs> New York City. I, I say that all the time. Like ever since I moved here, like whenever there's like an announcement or a sign or I'm just walking down the street, I'm like, New York City. I can't get it out of my head. It's great. Thank you, Andy. I'm really glad you like the book. You guys are liking uh, The Lightning Ground. Let me know. Just let me know. But let me let me talk about this. Uh, let me talk about this Hubble Space Telescope news. Before I start taking calls, I want to share some interesting bits of news I caught recently. And what really got on my radar is a very moist exoplanet. You know, we're looking for life outside the Earth. Like, that is one of the top goals in astronomy nowadays is the hunt for life outside of the Earth. It's a real game. It's a real thing we're doing. And what we're specifically looking for is a copy of the Earth. We're looking for a planet about the same size, about the right distance from its star with a star like the sun. 
We don't know what forms life may take in the universe, but we know what this kind of life looks like and acts like and smells like. So we're going to look for that because we know exactly what that looks like. We haven't found it yet. We haven't found one. We haven't found life. Otherwise, you know, we'd be talking about it nonstop. But we haven't found an exact copy of the Earth yet. But we keep getting closer and we keep seeing like interesting little parallels. You know, an Earth like planet with water on the surface, that's a unicorn. It's obviously special. We're not going to typically see that in the universe. Otherwise, we would have found like a thousand by now. So Earth-like planets are definitely unicorns. And there's this one planet that's hitting the news, uh, K218b. It's it's a unicorn, but it's kind of a stinky unicorn. It's not the greatest example, but it's a very interesting step. What, what K218b has is water in its atmosphere. Now, we found water in the atmospheres of planets before. That's not such a big deal. But this planet is in the habitable zone of its star, which means liquid water can potentially exist on its surface. So here we have a planet in the habitable zone of its star with confirmed water vapor in its atmosphere. Does that mean there's oceans? Does that mean there is life? Don't know yet. Don't know yet. It's not the greatest planet out there. That's why it's a little bit stinky to me. It's orbiting a red dwarf star. This thing is tiny. It's temperamental. It has massive flare-ups. I wouldn't want to live around it, but again, I didn't grow up in that kind of neighborhood. And also, it's kind of big. It's not an Earth-sized planet. It's a super Earth. It's eight times the mass of the Earth. Can life get started on a planet with such extreme gravity, so close to a temperamental dim star? Uh, We don't know. Jury's out. Jury's out. But it's very, very interesting. We have a planet. Doesn't quite check all the boxes, but it checks some very, very interesting ones like water vapor in its atmosphere. And we figured this out because as the planet swings in front of its star, some of that starlight passes through the atmosphere and any elements in the atmosphere will change the characteristic of that light. We can detect it through the spectrum. Voila, that is how we identify water vapor. And upcoming missions like the James Webb Space Telescope are going to do our going to do this a lot. So researchers for this particular example of K218b had to dig through Hubble Space Telescope archives, had to develop special algorithms to do it. It, it was They had to put a lot of work in. James Webb Space Telescope hopefully can do this on the snap. So let's see. Let's see. Is there life? I suppose we'll find out one of these days. Remember that is the latest and greatest when it comes to space. It's time to have a conversation. Remember, you can leave a voicemail or follow along live at spaceradioshow.com. Michael, yeah, it's eight times heavier. I think it's 2.7 times greater in radius. Although that seems a little bit off. Um, But it's, it's eight times the mass. Eight times the mass. Oh, 2.7 times the surface gravity. Or that makes that makes a lot more sense. Thank you, Alien of Soul 3. Even if it's aliens, it's not aliens. That's right, SAHM. That is our motto. If it's interesting, it's probably wrong. Can someone add that to my Wikipedia page? Do I have a quote of that somewhere on like like just anywhere? Like can someone add that like Sutter's Law cuz I want that to be a thing. Can we make this a thing? If if it's interesting, it's probably wrong. Oh, man, so many questions. But we do have some voicemails, so I'm going to do a couple voicemails. And then uh, we'll do lightning round again, unless you, unless you guys don't like my lightning rounds. You know, this show is for you. It's also for my own entertainment, but, you know, it's mostly for you. <sighs> 37% for you. 138 bad. We've got some voicemails ready to go from callers who ask questions. How simple is that? You go to spaceradioshow.com 
and you press a little button, you speak into your microphone, you ask your question, and then it gets on the air as soon as Greg can play the tape. Hi, Paul. Steve here, calling from Aberdeen, Scotland. I was inspired by your recent broadcast on the subject of light sails and their shortcomings caused by the lack of momentum inherent in photons. It made me think, why don't we install an ion engine on the moon and aim a stream of ions at the sail instead of photons? Ions have a colossal amount of momentum compared to photons and can be accelerated to very high velocities. What's the error in my thinking? Very, very fun question, Steve. So I, I, I did a whole Ask a Spaceman thing and a bunch of YouTube videos all about this breakthrough star shot initiative and the concept of using a light sail where light from the sun bounces off the sail and use that to accelerate the spacecraft. Your spacecraft has a way less than a paper clip or, or no breakthrough star shot. Use your lasers, more lasers, you know, literally trillions of times stronger than we our most powerful laser day. It's just listen to those episodes because they're, they're a, a hoot. Steve is wondering, why don't we use ion engines? Like, why don't we, like, shoot particles at the light sail instead of using lasers? Because particles have a lot more momentum to them, so they can kick around a spacecraft a lot better. There's a few reasons why this is actually going to be more challenging than using photons. Yes, the ions, like electrons or protons, whatever you want it to be, they have more momentum, which means you have to do a lot more work to accelerate it. So to shoot the beam of ions at the light sail, you need a big ion gun, and you need to spend even more energy to accelerate those ions to get them out to your light sail. And that's actually going to cost more energy than just using a laser. And second, ions are affected by magnetic fields. And our solar system is awash in magnetic fields. We have the Earth's magnetic field. We have the Sun's magnetic field. We have Jupiter's magnetic field. You shoot these ions around trying to go long distances and trying to be ultra super precise because you're aiming this spacecraft at another star. Man... Just that level of precision with all these wiggling, wobbling magnetic fields, it's going to go nuts. So actually lasers are the best bet, but even that is going to be incredibly challenging. All right, I think we got time for more. Greg, hit another button and play the tape. Good morning, Dr. Sutter. Hey, quick question. Was there ever a phase in the universe's earliest development where gravity was not yet a thing and if so would that phase not be characterized by the dimension of space-time just wondering if space-time and gravity evolve in lockstep and at the same time and in the same ways thank you so much a oh, really awesome question here, Lori. So gravity is linked to space-time. This is our modern understanding of gravity. You bend and warp space-time. This is our experience of gravity. So as Lori is asking, has gravity always been a thing? Yes and no. Gravity has always been around, but we suspect in the very earliest moments of our universe, it was merged with the other forces of nature, where all four forces of nature were unified into a single force. In that case, if that is accurate, and we're pretty sure it is, then gravity by itself ceases to exist. There's only this single unified force. What happens to space-time at those scales? Because gravity is bending a space-time, we honestly don't know. This is a question that can only be answered by a theory of gravity, which we don't have. Don't let the string theorists fool you. We do not have a quantum theory of gravity yet. Super fun question, Lori. Maybe we'll figure it out someday. I don't know. I don't think I'm going to be the one, but... Hopefully one of these days we crack quantum gravity. 
Thanks for those awesome questions and thanks for pressing those buttons, Greg. I really appreciate it. We're going to take a quick break. Don't forget to leave a voicemail to join the conversation or catch the live streams on YouTube and Twitch. Go to spaceradioshow.com for all those links. I'm Paul Sutter. This is Space Radio and this show is brought to you by you. Go to patreon.com slash pmsutter to learn how you can keep this show going. It's true. You're literally paying as little as $1 a month to keep this show alive. How can I thank you? Probably by saying thank you. And I'll see you after the break. Very, very fun question, Lori. Oh, yeah. I mean, can you imagine the escape velocity on these things? On these uh, super earths? Like... I think there's a limit, if I'm remembering right, maybe I'm making this up, where the escape velocity is so big that chemically powered rockets will never be able to to reach it. And so you can't send things to orbit, you can't send things out exploring space, you just can't. And if you can't do chemically powered rockets, are you just going to be ground bound forever? It's, a, it's an interesting question. I think we have a lot of space connect questions. All right. Oh, so many. So many. You guys blow me away, by the way. Oh, did we lose? Is my live stream all right? Okay. I think I'm doing all right. Stream health good. All my, all my thingies are good. Sorry about that, folks. I've been fighting with my uh, my internet. It hasn't been the greatest. But we got so many Space Cadet questions. I think it's time for another lightning round. You guys let me know if you don't like the lightning rounds. I'm having a lot of fun with the lightning rounds. If you ask me, which nobody is. Okay, you guys fixed it. It was your problem. It was your fault, Larry. Why you keep messing with things, Larry? You just got to let it go. Yeah, it's you. It's your fault. Everyone, just blame Larry. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Paul Sutter, and this is Space Radio. We've got more questions ready to go, but remember, you can join the conversation by leaving an online voicemail or by following the live streams. Go to spaceradioshow.com for the links now. Once again, I have so many Space Cadet questions lined up that it's time for a lightning round. Greg, are you going to add music here or not? No, that's fine. We're just going to go. Boom. Uh, Vinayak Sharma Sharma of Tally on YouTube is asking, is it true that black holes hold pure dark energy? Black holes don't, they do have a lot of vacuum inside of them. They have a lot of empty space. And wherever there's empty space, there's dark energy because it's a property of empty space. But all the mass, all the matter of a black hole is concentrated in that infinitely dense point at the center called a singularity. Now, do we fully understand understand singularities? No, but we wish we did. Isaac Grimes on YouTube is asking, how come black holes are still black if you're to fall inside of one? From the outside, because light can't escape, but once you're inside with the light, like just why is it dark? Very, very cool question. The way I like to visualize black holes, and this is backed up by the mathematics, is a place where space itself is flowing inwards. It's it's like it's like a waterfall or like a sinkhole in the water, where water just keeps flowing and flowing and flowing, where space itself flows in towards the center. In the event horizon, the edge of the black hole is that place where the space is flowing in faster than the speed of light. So if you're a beam of light and you want to get out, if you're just outside the event horizon, then you can fight against that onrushing you know, waterfall of space and you can make it out. But if you're at the event horizon, you try to get out because you're going the speed of light, but space itself is dragging you in faster than the speed of light and so that you never escape. So all this stuff that goes in, 
the light that tries to get out is like climbing up a waterfall. It's just, it just can't do it. Campbell Duncan on Twitch. How likely would it be for us to find very heavy elements like gold and radioactive elements on planets and other solar systems when they aren't created in normal supernova? Yeah, so we know that the heavy elements in the periodic table are created by a couple different processes. One is from supernova, the death of massive stars. And the other is killing Nova, which is what happens when two neutron stars merge together. And the killing Nova are responsible for more of some elements like gold, while the supernova are responsible for more elements like other elements that will go unnamed because I can't remember them off the top of my head right now. And our solar system, our particular solar system, has a lot of gold in it. And there's a, there was relatively nearby in the distant past a Kilanova detonation that seeded our solar system with a lot of gold. So Campbell's asking, like, if you go to just some random part of the galaxy... If it didn't happen to be near a kilonova in the past 5 billion years, is there going to be a lot of gold there? And then the answer is no. The particular mix of elements in a solar system depends on what kind of activity happened nearby in the past few billion years. It's almost like a like a genetic tree, or, you know, like like parents and children. Like if you there a certain trait can only come about from a combination of genes, and so you need the right lineage in order to have that trait. But we're still working out. We we haven't studied the elemental composition position of many solar systems so we're still working out the demographics of that atom synergy on youtube the james webb space telescope is getting shipped to its launch site on a barge just an ordinary barge should i be worried you know what when it comes to hauling big giant heavy things on the ocean do you have another better option than a normal barge that's all I'm asking, Adam. That's all I'm asking. Andy Cowley on YouTube. What do we think of the new planet with water on it? Yeah, this this K218b. Very cool. There's not we don't know if there's water on the surface. We know there's water in the atmosphere, which is a new thing. Because it's in the habitable zone. Is there water on the surface? We just don't know. Philippo on YouTube. Uh Let's talk about this K218b. It's This planet is eight times the mass of the Earth. The surface gravity is 2.7 times Earth gravity. So it's like living at 2.7 G. Can it have a proper atmosphere? Can there be life? Like this is a, this is a lot of gravity. K218b does have an atmosphere. That's how we figure out there's water vapor inside of it. Certainly massive plants can have nice thick atmospheres. Can there be life? What would it look like? I was talking with the space cadets uh, in, during the break, and even if life does appear, it could be that chemical rockets aren't powerful enough to get you to escape velocity, so you may never have a space program, which is kind of depressing. Can life appear on a planet like this? Probably. I mean, life is pretty, pretty ingenious when you think about it. But we'll see. This is just such an open, wonderful, mysterious question that we just don't know the right conditions it takes to lead to life. Maybe giant planets are no-goes. Maybe most life appears on giant planets and we're the oddballs. Who knows? It's a very, very fun question to consider. SAHM on YouTube is asking... He remembers Kip Thorne was discussing an element of space going into a black hole, getting thinner and flatter as it's closer. Uh, does that mean that the source behind the event horizon is one-dimensional? The singularity of a black hole is zero-dimensional. It's a point in space, a geometric point. And the event horizon itself is a two-dimensional surface surrounding that, the surface of a sphere. 
as you fall in, because all that gravity is concentrated in a single point, that is going to make you elongate and stretch out and thin out this awesome process that we literally call spaghettification. And that is because all the matter is compressed into a zero dimensional point. Harry Miles on YouTube. How surprised would I be if we found life elsewhere in the solar system? You know, some people are surprised. I am generally a curmudgeon when it comes to new or exciting discoveries in astronomy. And I try not to get my hopes up about exciting new discoveries, especially when it comes to extraterrestrial life, because that is such a high bar to clear. I have a soft spot in my heart for the icy moons of the outer worlds. These ones that are encased in ice and have tons of liquid water, you know, these vast world spanning liquid water oceans. Are there space whales in the waters of Europa? Probably not. Are there space bacteria in the waters of Europa? I don't know. There's something about it that just gets me excited, and I can't deny it. It gets my heart all a fluttery. And maybe, 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 50 50. That's as much as I'm giving you. That's as much as this, this curmudgeon heart is giving you. Michael on YouTube. Uh, oh, no, skip it because we talked about we talked about the surface gravity and the mass. We got time for a quick one. Nebula cluster, what kind of gravity could anything get off of it? Oh, yeah, with that kind of gravity, could anything get off of it? Maybe. Could the aliens of K-218B have space flight? It's going to be way tough for them. Man, we are almost out of time. But before we go, it's time for the blue shift. Wow. I love the lightning rounds. I don't know about you guys. Maybe if uh, if there's a week where we don't have any voicemails, then I do a couple space to get questions like longer and then always do that second half lightning round. I don't know. I'm kind of making it up as I go along here, folks. Not the science. Not the science. The science is legit. That's memory. I promise I'm not making up my answers on the spot. All right, what are we going to do for the, the blue shift? And stick around, folks, because uh, uh, Greg's going to visit me again at the end of the show. Yes, there is cheese involved. I'm Paul Sutter, and you're listening to Space Radio, and this is the blue shift, my opportunity to get a little bit closer to you. And I recently posted on my blog called Ab Initio, which you can find at pmsutter.com slash notes about uh, what science is and the nature of science. And, and this gets into the philosophy of science and views of science, uh, which is a very, very complex and nuanced and very fun topic. I come down on the side that, that what we expose or what we understand in our scientific theories isn't reality itself, but representations of reality, uh, of mathematics that try to capture the behavior of nature, but isn't nature itself. Like, we can talk all day about, say, quantum fields. Quantum fields are a cornerstone of modern physics. Do quantum fields actually exist? I mean, that's a pretty deep question, right? We use quantum fields to explain the behavior of subatomic systems, and it's our best model so far, but does that mean quantum fields actually exist? But of course, if you start going down these lines, you start asking, does anything exist? Do electrons exist, or are they just mathematical models? Do my hands exist, or are they just models in my brain? Ooh starts to get a little bit tough, but it's a fun thing to think about on a random Saturday afternoon. Uh, and speaking of things to do where we can have very cool and fun discussions, I am leading another Astro Tour. We're doing a Caribbean cruise next August, August of 2020. We are leaving out of Galveston, Texas, which is going to be so awesome because we're visiting 
the Houston Space Center, and then we're getting on a ship, and we are going to do stargazing every single night. We're going to visit some Mayan ruins to explore how they understood astronomy. And if you've ever thought to yourself, man, I would love to go on vacation, but I wish Paul Sutter would come with us. Huh. This is your chance. Astro.tours. Astro.tours. Space is limited. Get your name and register so you reserve a spot. And I would love to see you in the Caribbean. How, how much fun is that? A lot of fun is the answer to that question. And unfortunately, this broadcast is almost done. Thank you for joining me on this voyage of space radio. Once again, I'm Paul Sutter, and this show is brought to you by you. Visit patreon.com slash pmsutter to learn how you can contribute. Thanks to Greg Mobius for producing, Nancy Graziano for wrangling the space cadets, and all the fine crew at WCBE Radio for making this show possible. Catch the live stream every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern. Visit spaceradioshow.com for more info, links to the live stream locations, and the episode archive. And of course, thanks again, space cadets, for listening. See you next week. And remember, science is for sharing. End of transmission. Yay! No, I got cheese. Don't worry, guys. I got cheese. But first, uh, I need some title suggestions. Title suggestions, folks. Is it getting dark in here? I think a storm's coming in. I need... What do you think? I mean, we can just keep it up with uh, moist exoplanets if you want, or we can do something more fun. Thank you, Alan Alien of Soul 3. Hmm. Let's bring Greg in. Let's have some cheese. I wanted to. If any of you own like a grocery store and want to sponsor Space Radio, I will do a cheese break in the show. No joke. I will do a cheese break in the show. And it will be a part of the show. But let's bring Greg in. Greg, why aren't you on top? Oh, I see. I see. There you are, Greg. There you go. You want some cheese, Greg? I know you do. Who doesn't? Today I brought... Oh, by the way, remember last week I had the uh, the Havarti with wild garlic? And I was like, I don't taste garlic. This is tiny little green things. Apparently, I am not a culinary expert, folks. I'm not a cheese expert. I'm an amateur cheese enthusiast. Apparently, wild garlic is like an herb. It's like a grass that just vaguely tastes like garlic. And my whole complaint last week was Havarti with dill. Havarti with dill. Why do we have to put grass inside of our Havarti to enjoy it? And I was like very excited because, ooh, garlic inside of my Havarti. That's a new taste bud experience. No, no. It's just more grass inside of my Havarti. Come on, Havarti makers. Come on. You're more clever than this. So today I brought a goat cheese, a La Bon Vie brand. Uh, we got some goat cheese authentic chev with uh, tomato and basil. I've been on a kick recently with, with things, you know, mixed into my cheeses. But I'll get some good pure ones with unmixed and I know I've got two creamies in a row. Look, it just looked good at the grocery store and it was on sale, okay? That's, that's why I picked it. Now, I love goat cheese. I've heard it smells like, yeah, yeah, wild garlic smells like garlic, but it just tastes like generic herbs. Now, look at that. I did bring crackers for the goat cheese, mostly. You know, I like to enjoy my cheese. Uh -huh. I'll come out. Well, oh, hmm. Am I too close to the microphone with this chewing noises? Wow. I love a good goat cheese. You know, there's this tanginess that you just don't get. Oh, you want a bite, Craig? Oh, you're just sitting there looking at me. There you go. There you go, buddy. Where are you? There you go. That's good, isn't it, Greg? I'm not lonely, folks. <laughs> I'm not talking to a picture of Greg. Mm. 
It grows abundantly here in the UK. Oh, the, we're still in the wild garlic. Oh, this is a fantastic goat cheese. La Bon V. Is it? Product of USA. That's fine. Us Americans that can make a goat cheese. We have goats here too. And goat milk. And good cheese is good cheese. I'm not going to be picky about where it comes from. But uh, this is a tasty goat cheese. What do you do? Oh, yeah. I was going to say, what do you go with goat cheese? I love making... Was it like Ballantines? Like where you roll up meat with some cheese? Mm. Uh-huh. Chopping down. And where do you get high from cheese? How are you even alive? I just don't understand that. Oh, uh, bye, Amanda. Does goat cheese smell like goat? No. No. It smells like cheese. Look at that. It just smells like cheese. Mmm. This is a good one. I like the tomato. There's a nice, mmm, earthy tomato presence. It's surrounding me with some cheese, but that's every single week. That's every single week, Philip. I do have a question for you guys. Uh, for those of you still here, yeah, I do ASMR, uh, eating cheese. I probably make way more money doing that. Here's the thing: I'm thinking of switching the show to be eight o'clock Eastern time on Thursday. Still Thursdays, but pushing it back four hours. I know, I know. Some of you, especially uh, friends in Europe, UK. If that's gonna that's gonna push it too late for you. It's just schedule wise, the way things are shaping out here in New York, like uh, yeah, an evening show would be a little bit better. So, but just let me know. Just let me know. Um like how much you would rebel against the idea if if you would still be able to make it, because I'm starting to get to know some of you. I mean, not like friends or anything, but you know, we're starting to get to know with this guy. And I'll talk with my mouth full. I don't care. I know. Okay, okay. I thought it's going to be a little bit split. Some people are totally cool with it. They can make an 8 o'clock Eastern work. Some of it just kills it. Okay. Well, just let me know. In the comments, uh, shoot me an email what you think. Larry, you can deal with it. You better deal with it, especially since you're having issues with the video, Larry. You're just gonna, you're just gonna take it like a champ. All right. This is good cheese, isn't it, Greg? Greg is a goat cheese connoisseur. Um, did you know that Greg once uh, he used to raise goats? Mm-hmm. It's true. He had a small farm outside uh, the city limits of Columbus. Uh, Greg the goat herd, we call him. It. So he. Every spring, he'd take his flocks down to Alabama, uh, you know, for the grazing grounds. And he'd come back up towards, right towards the end of summer. You know, just, I don't know, it doesn't make any sense, like, timing-wise, you know, because, like, why would you bring the goats to Columbus in the middle of winter when it's just, when it's just, uh, you know, snow? But Greg was his own man. All right. I got to take off. <laughs> I apologize, Edward Hidden. I'm not exactly sure what I'm apologizing for, but you have it. And uh, next week, I will be out. I'm traveling next week, but so I'll see you in two weeks. Maybe at the new time. Maybe not. But there'll be more cheese. Because there's always more cheese.